Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I want to take you through uh, Arizona's uh, most current situation uh, with COVID-19 and give you a school update uh, as, as well. I want to begin by once again just saying thank you to all the doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals. We know how hard you're working. Uh, we're grateful for what you're doing. Uh, what I'm asking Arizonans to do is to continue to support these professionals in the work that they uh, have in front of them. And I want to thank our business leaders, our workforce, really everyone. This has affected everyone in, inside our state. And uh, I'm grateful uh, we're in a better spot today than we were several weeks ago. And uh, I want to show you what the numbers are and also what we believe some of the reasons and mitigations that have worked. Uh, all of the numbers that I'm going to uh, show you today are heading in the right direction. We've got our COVID-like illness in emergency rooms dropping. We've got our COVID patient ICU and hospital bed uses trending down. And our percentage of positive tests is headed in the right direction as well. Let's start with the COVID-like illness surveillance. The blue line is the COVID line. You can see over the last three plus weeks, the dramatic and marked improvement in a downward trajectory close to where we were back in uh, March. We've got a little ways to go, but this has been happening over the last three weeks with dramatic improvement each week in terms of consistent decreases. In terms of COVID-19 cases by day, this trend was up beginning in June. Uh, since early July, it has been on a downward trend. Fewer, so we've got fewer cases and it's headed in the right direction. In terms of hospital beds for COVID-19, we've not had to use our additional surge capacity that we have. Um, that's good. Uh, and today we're seeing a decrease in COVID patients needing a hospital bed. And the same is true for our intensive care units as well. We're seeing a downward trajectory in terms of the number of COVID patients that need an ICU bed, and that's good as well. Uh, the surge capacity has not been necessary to date. And on ventilators, we're also seeing a slight decrease in COVID patients that need ventilators. This is uh, the COVID tracking project. These are uh, professionals that share their information with Johns Hopkins and uh, the White House Coronavirus Task Force, as well as other uh, mainstream outlets. The red line is Arizona's daily cases. The blue line is our current hospitalization rate. You can see that this uh, began to spike uh, in early July and since then for the remainder of July has been on a downward trend and trajectory both in cases and hospitalizations, both positives. This is our testing by day. We've exceeded over 1.1 million tests in Arizona, and we need more. You can see the testing spikes and testing surges. We're gonna talk a little bit more about testing in just a few minutes. This is what we're measuring. The blue graph here is the amount of tests that have been conducted. The gold line is the percent positivity. Uh, it's been as high as north of 20%. Uh, this last week, it was at 11%. You can see how after the stay-at-home order, how we were flat through there. Two weeks later, uh, it began to spike. And again, these are people that we're testing that are sick, they are symptomatic, and they've been exposed uh, to COVID-19. We're going to talk about some of the additional testing we're going to have capacity for in August and, and September that can dramatically affect that number. 
Let's take a look at the r naught. This is something that was introduced just over a month ago. This is a number that is followed around the country, state by state. It's the average number of people who become infected by an infectious person. When it was first introduced to Arizona on, uh, in this press event uh, in, in late June, Arizona was at 1.18. You want to be at one or below. We had a ways to go on June 29th. I asked people if they limited mobility, if they would follow the, the direction of being safer at home, of if they had something to do to go do it and head home, we could move this number in the right direction. Today, we've moved it 28 basis points. Uh, we're as good today, and this is a fluid number, but today and yesterday, we've been as good as any state in the nation. We're at 0.9, that means we're going to have decreasing cases. I wanna thank the people of Arizona. This is because of your good decisions, your good habits, uh, all the things that we're talking about in terms of fundamentals and limiting mobility has put Arizona in a better position today than we were just a short time ago. So what I wanna say is we can deliver some good numbers today. Uh, this is not a victory lap. This is not a celebration. If anything, it's evidence that de the decisions and the sacrifice that Arizonans are making are working. They are protecting lives and they are protecting livelihoods in our state. And I wanna say how much I thank you for your cooperation and your partnership in getting this done. The mitigation steps that we've taken are making a difference. We're gonna to continue to measure those uh, along the way, but the important thing right now for er every Arizonan to do their part are the fundamentals of physically distancing, washing your hands, and when possible, making the decision that you're safer at home. It's really making a difference along with masking up. We've got nearly 90% of the state that's wearing a mask today. It's making a, a real difference. I'm grateful for what you're doing. We're gonna share with you some of the spots and statewide investment we're making in advocating uh, masks. I also wanna thank our private sector partners. I don't think there's a place that you can eat or, or shop or uh, get goods or services without wearing a mask. And it's, it's been very helpful to have maximum compliance. So I wanna thank everyone for doing their part on that uh, today. And uh, with that, I wanna give a quick school update before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Christ. I wanna thank uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, who has been a leader in a partner in making sure we do the right thing so that all Arizona kids can be in the safest possible environment along with their teachers and staff members inside of our schools. We wanted to provide maximum resources and maximum flexibility so that we would have options and safety for our parents. Uh, if you wanna know what's going on in your school district, please check your local website. But in terms of virtual learning, that can begin as soon as the superintendent intends it to, and I know it's happening already in some parts of our state. The same with on-site support services. And in terms of in-person teacher-led classroom, there's going to be more to follow from the Department of Health Services and Department of Education in terms of guidelines and metrics. And I also want to thank the superintendents, the principals, and the teachers for all their input and help as we've made these decisions so that we can really set a standard of having the best possible educational year for every Arizona kid and family in the safest environment that suits that family. And with that, I wanna turn it over to uh, Dr. Kara Christ, who leads our public health efforts. Thank her for all her hard work in advance and give us an update, doctor. Thank you, Governor. Um, this week, it was announced that there is a task force on long-term care. Um, 
like all of you, we recognize that there have been individuals that are in these facilities that have not had visitors um, given the, the pandemic. And so uh, the governor established the task force on long-term care. They are going to meet, they are going to develop recommendations and metrics on how and when visitation within long-term care facilities can be safely resumed and they'll identify what steps those facilities can take to help the residents um, and their loved ones maintain contact because we know how important that is um, to the families and the residents. It consists of um, a lot of different uh, professionals. It's got experts in long-term care, in operating long-term care facilities. It's got public health and access, AARP, and members of the governor's office in the legislature. So we're very excited to get that, that going so that we can get those recommendations and get visitors back into our long-term care facilities. Um, for a testing update, we currently have 375 test collection sites across the state. You can find that on our website if you go to azhealth.gov. We, you can find it by either looking on the map or by clicking and looking for um, searching uh, for a location close to you. We're continuing to build lab capacity throughout the state, so we continue to work with our laboratory partners. One of the partners that we are working with is Sonora Quest. We still continue to see delays, which is frustrating for public health, because we would like to get those turnaround times faster so that we can do the contact investigations and make a difference um, in, in slowing the spread. Sonora Quest updates us daily. Their current testing backlog is approximately 29,000 labs. They believe that they will have that backlog cleared by this Sunday. And um, they are still on track to get that um, project catapult up and running at full capacity so that they can have 60,000 PCR test capacity per day by the end of August. For the convalescent plasma, a lot of people um, who have had COVID-19 have developed antibodies as part of the immune response um, to, to the disease. And that is actually, can, it can be collected and used as a treatment for people who have se severe COVID-19. And so what we're asking everybody, if you've had COVID-19 and you've recovered from it, consider donating blood because that's where we get the source of the convalescent plasma. Um, this is very, very important for those that might be critically ill. And then we'd like to um, announce a new initiative that we're putting as part of the uh, post-acute care capacity initiative. It's $1 million. What we have found is as the Arizona surge line is transferring individuals to the appropriate level of care, sometimes that takes them out of their home, out of rural areas and brings them into the metropolitan areas. Getting them home has um, resulted in some of the insurance companies such as Medicare fee for service or those that don't have insurance um, having a, a cost to actually be returned home. So we are gonna set up a fund to reimburse hospitals that are trying to reunite um, those patients after they've recovered back home or to get them to a post-acute care facility at that um, in their home area. And so patients that will be eligible will include those that are COVID positive or um, suspected if they are on Medicare only, fee for service or uninsured, there's gonna be limits to the costs that there can be and the hospital that's sending them home needs to have tried all of the vendors on the PACT line. Thank you. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Major General Mick McGuire and thank him for his hard work, not only with the National Guard, but with emergency management, and I'll also express our condolences for the National Guardsmen that we lost this, this week, and I know you're going to give an update on that as well. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody, thank you, Governor. Uh, quickly on an update on our activities uh, as, it, as it pertains to the COVID-19 response, we were able to close out the surge testing site in Maryvale and South Mountain. Over 12 days, we did uh, 15,146 of the 60,000 uh, allocated tests. The balance of those nearly 45,000 tests 
will be going 20,000 to Pima County, 15,000 to Coconino County, and 10,000 to Yuma County, and we'll begin that effort uh, this weekend, uh, moving the task force into those areas. Additionally, uh, there's been a lot of questions about food bank and logistics mission, and I'm, I'm happy to report that the governor has allowed us to continue to support those missions, and we will continue to do that through the next month while the uh, federal government uh, manages decisions on uh, use of federal funding. Uh, and finally, as the governor mentioned, uh, tragically, uh, yesterday in a very uh, untimely incident, um, we lost a second lieutenant, uh, uh, Robert Dwayne Bryant Jr., better known as DJ, a uh, young uh, Lieutenant Bryant, uh, graduated here in the Valley High School in 2015. Uh, in 2017, he proudly joined the Phoenix Police Department working for Chief Jerry Williams and being one of our first responders that I've talked about in all of these press conferences in the past. You've also heard me say many times that a lot of these uh, folks in our community serve simultaneously as members of the Guard. And he went to Arizona State University as a Phoenix cop and an enlisted uh, soldier in the National Guard and earned his commission as a second lieutenant recently through the ASU ROTC detachment was uh, Tuesday morning testing, uh, doing his physical fitness assessment to go off to his Army basic officer course for uh, his uh, role as an Army military police officer, and unfortunately uh, passed out uh, uh, during his run. We took him to uh, Tempe St. Luke's, the paramedics responded. We always have a medic out there, uh, and he passed uh, yesterday afternoon as a result of his injuries. Uh, and we appreciate the governor uh, recognizing that and uh, uh, taking that moment of honor to lower the flags to half staff in his memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, General, and, and again, our, our condolences. Uh, to DJ and, and his family. Moving forward, I want to talk about our plan of action in Arizona. To date, we have had 170,798 COVID-like cases. That's been an average of 2,533 cases per day this week. And our thoughts and prayers and condolences go out to every Arizona family that has lost a loved one. To date, 3,626 in the state of Arizona. You can see the direction of our cases and our hospital capacity today. Uh, so the actions that we're taking in Arizona are making a difference. We will continue to work this plan as we have the virus with us, which is going to be for the foreseeable future. So it's going to be a responsible approach. It's going to be focused and guided by public health with the top priority of protecting lives. We're going to continue to ramp up testing, and there's much that needs to be improved and fixed with testing to identify infections in our state. You'll see additional lab capacity and additional collection sites in addition to 375 that we have today. And we'll work with county health officials on contact tracing to contain the spread and monitor the efficacy of the mitigation strategies that we have in effect today and whatever is going to be necessary for the future. Again, We'll be watching the cases. We'll be watching the testing and percent positivity rate. Those are headed in the right direction today and for the last few weeks. The mobility and the r naught is something that you can affect by being safer at home, by making those decisions to limit that. And like I said, Arizona is in a much better place today. And with the ability and technology and innovation that we see coming in testing, along with the supply chain, reagents, and swabs, we'll be able to better monitor our care for Arizonans as well as have capacity, if necessary, headed into the fall in terms of hospitals. Again, Action steps are wear a mask, wash your hands, physically distance, and when possible, stay home. Uh, in terms of masking up, I want to again thank Arizonans for their cooperation and participation in this effort. It goes a long way in terms of slowing the spread and protecting people. We've had our private sector step up, uh, help us with some ads to 
promote this and the state's providing resources to do this across the state. I want to thank all the firms on this page and share with you some of what we have coming forward. Uh, this is uh, going to be a, a digital and billboard uh, ad uh, in terms of, of posters and uh, bus stops as well, uh, just to promote masking up in Arizona. We've got uh, this, our uh, professional sports teams have gotten their mascots involved and in wearing a mask, and I think you'll see all of Arizona's uh, major, major teams and universities participating in a really good ad. And then I know we're all looking forward to the eventual return of live sports with fans in attendance, and that one's next. And again, we'll have, we'll have some print and digital and, and billboard uh, along with that as well, hitting every demographic across our market, both in uh, English and Spanish. So remember, wear a mask. The virus is widespread. You're safer at home. I do want to say again, thank you for the participation and cooperation, not a victory lap or a celebration, evidence that the mitigation and the steps that we're taking are, are working, so let's continue doing that. Let's keep it up, let's stay vigilant, and with that, let's open it up to questions. Patrick? Let's start with Keith here over here. Uh, So it's a, it's a good question. It's one I'm, I'm hearing not only around school districts, but of course small businesses as well. Uh, we wrote a, a letter to Congress. We're working with our uh, uh, federal delegation on, on these issues. We want to see our school districts, of course, following uh, CDC and public health guidelines, and we want to see them be able to conduct school in, in the safest possible way and to be free from anything that would be a frivolous or predatory uh, lawsuit. So that's something we're going to continue to work on. Well, I, I want to just say as clearly as I can that Congress needs to act. This is on Congress. Arizona is doing its part. The federal government has to do their part. In Arizona, we live by a balanced budget. We have made the difficult decisions at the state level, and we don't have the ability to print money. If I had any advice for Congress, it would be to turn around, order sandwiches in, stay the weekend, and figure this out. Hi, Howie. Mississippi is lower. That number hasn't been raised since 2004. And you kept saying, don't worry, we've got the $600 a week. Now, Howie, I, know, I have not said don't worry in this. In this. Well, I have not said don't worry in this press conference. Okay. You've said that the people are getting $600 a week, and that's taking care of it. As of right now, this is the last week people are getting those checks. What are you willing to do, even as a stopgap measure, to help these people who are going to be losing $600 a week starting Monday. Arizona is going to do its part to do 
uh, what's necessary. We're going to need cooperation from Congress. Like I said, we don't print money at the state level. We're not in a position today, especially during a pandemic, to be borrowing money. Uh, I've heard a lot from many people in, in this room about the priority uh, in the first year to balance the budget, the priority in the last year to raise the rainy day fund to a, a billion dollar balance. So Arizona, like I said, is doing its part, but in terms of what's necessary in this environment, right now in this economy, we need Congress to do its part. I couldn't be more clear on that. Well, how about raising the unemployment benefits for Arizonans, which haven't been raised since 2004? I've answered the question. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to ask for it? Are you willing to even consider it? I mean, could you exist on 240 a week? How we, we've been working with the federal government on this, the, the program has been plussed up. Uh, the Department of Economic Security, the dollars that we're putting forward for foster children, for developmentally disabled, are all a priority in our state. But this is a, but just, just to be clear, this is a Congress trust, has got to do its part, Howie. But th this is the trust fund paid for by the employers in Arizona. This is a self Congress has fund. got to do its part. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Governor, two questions today. Uh, the first one about the upcoming election. The President of the United States today suggested maybe we should delay the election due to the pandemic. You know he does not agree with mail-in ballots, which, which we do have here in Arizona. I'd like to get your response to possibly delaying the election, and do you support Arizonans that don't feel comfortable going to the polling place and mailing in ballots? Secondly, we didn't hear anything about bars, theaters, and gyms today. Business owners are really hurting in those categories, as well as workers. Is there any hope, is there any kind of date uh, for opening bars, gyms, and theaters? So three questions there. Uh, three. Let me answer them. Uh, first, in Arizona, we're going to follow the law. Uh, election day in the United States is the, uh, the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. It's November 3rd this year, and there will be an election on November 3rd. Uh, I'm supportive of people that want to mail in a ballot. I believe you still have time. If you want to get on the uh, permanent early voter list, you can go to uh, the county recorders and, and uh, apply for that. So you'll have that option in Arizona, of course, and uh, you'll have election day voting as, as well, and it will be safe. I didn't mention about bars and gyms this week because we talked about it last week and that it had been extended for an additional 14 days. We're working with stakeholder groups uh, in each of the affected industries by the coronavirus and the mandates that we've made from the state level. I do want to give them hope. I mean, the good news is, is we're headed in the right direction. We're also seeing success in these mitigation strategies. I've mentioned a couple of times that we've been in the uh, unhappy but uh, necessary business of breaking up large adult gatherings. So we are working with these uh, stakeholder groups. These businesses can be run in a way that uh, adheres to CDC and the Department of Health Services guidance, but it's going to be a change and somewhat of a dramatic change in the short term in terms of operations. So there will be more to follow on that. Of course, the numbers and public health are going to determine our decisions, but we're working with the leaders. We had a, a conference call yesterday, uh, went out to I think 2,500 business owners uh, across the state. Uh, a lot of very fair and, and challenging questions as to our thought process on this and what the future could, could look like. So uh, we, we want to be helpful. This is where the priority of protecting lives coming first uh, has to do with some of these more difficult and uh, unpopular decisions. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, Billy. We're going to go to Zoom next. We're going to take a question from Lily Altavena from the Arizona Republic. Lily, go ahead. Hi, Governor. Thousands of Arizona kids will attend the first day of school virtually next week with a lot of uncertainty over reopening. We don't know yet what data benchmarks DHS will set. Do you have any sense of what those benchmarks will be and any words of reassurance for Arizona families who don't know what plans to make? 
Well, thank you for the question. I mean, the first thing I, I want to say is we wanted to put together a, a menu of options for, for parents and, and families and teachers that all have different challenges out there in different parts of the state. We want it to be the safest, most successful school year possible. And I've tasked Dr. Kara Christ, who's working with Superintendent Kathy Hoffman and the Department of Education to look at the guidelines and metrics from around the country that are in alignment with the Centers for Disease Control so that we can provide the, the safest uh, information going forward for which uh, uh, leaders to make decisions. You want to touch a, a little bit on where we are on that process, Doctor? Sure. So we are developing the uh, the draft benchmarks. We're working with stakeholders um, throughout this week to identify metrics that will be clear, um, and that can be brought down to the county level because what we want to do is we want to give the schools the flexibility to know when their community um, can return to school. And so our local health departments have been an integral part of this. It will be data that people are familiar with and have seen and will be able to be displayed on our dashboard and it will be available by, by the 7th. Governor, it seems that uh, what you all said last week about schools and about creating these benchmarks hasn't helped stabilize families and schools over the past week only bringing more chaos to these decisions. Parents are being asked to make decisions today on whether or not they will put their kids in school in person on the 17th, possibly, possibly not, or if they're going to make a long-term commitment to do some sort of online learning. Why did the administration not work weeks ago to develop these kinds Melissa, of benchmarks? What, what, you, what you've just characterized around the school plan is just completely inaccurate. Uh, we've worked with uh, superintendents and uh, 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 leaders across the state to provide options for parents. There are some parents that are, are in a situation that regardless of what happens, their child is not, due to their decision making, is not going to return to school until there's a vaccine. There is an option for that parent and that family. There are parents that can't wait for the first day of in classroom instruction. They want their child sitting in the front row. There are options for that parent. And there are parents that don't have a choice because their child needs to go somewhere on the first day of school. And there will be an option for, for those parents. This plan was put together with superintendents and leaders from across the state to serve the needs of parents and children of each background. But Governor, there has not been a definitive answer from this administration, from the Department of Health Services about when it's actually safe to do so. August 17th is the date that we set in terms of uh, school beginning, but classes can start before that. It's up to the superintendent. And August 7th is the date that the guidance and metrics will come forward. But that gives schools and districts 10 days between then and the 17th to rework their entire plans. Is and, that fair And parents to have all available options. Do you think that's fair to parents in the school districts to have such a short timeline between when these metrics come out and the actual first day of We school? said last week that, that parents and children should prepare to begin learning. And they're working with their superintendents and school districts on the specific dates. Some are already doing it right now and doing it very successfully. Hi, Governor. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good, thanks. Um, I want to dive into sports here for a couple questions with you. It's more pressing matters, but it's now starting to come to light on the high school end. I've had David Hines from the AIA on several times, and there's practices going on at some high schools. Brophy's pushed back theirs. Tucson's not doing anything. Other states have had rulings from their governors. High school sports. What is your stance for right now and moving forward for this year and starting and playing this year? So we're, we're working, of course, with public health and following CDC guidance. Schools are making their own decisions at this uh, stage. 
uh, and sports are following really what the school direction is. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the public health guidance around sports at this time going forward, Doctor? Yes. There are, it, it's going to depend on the local community. So really what are, what are the conditions going on in the, the local community and what type of sports it's going to be. So non-contact sports can, can um, play right now. It, it, that is a lower risk. If they're going to do contact sports, they're gonna wanna take into account what the transmission is in that community. And that's where also the benchmarks will come in, but it is left up to the, the schools and the local health departments. So in California, they have pushed back to January to play football. Football is a contact sport. New Mexico's pushed back. Virginia's pushed back. Several states have pushed back. The governors have weighed in. Do you feel as though playing football is safe right now for high school kids and being out on the fields? So I'm going to follow the the public health guidance on this. We are having discussions not only with the Department of Health Services, but the AIA is providing their input. And uh, we wanna do our best to have the most successful school year around academics. That's the priority. And where it is gonna be possible for participation in sports, whether non-contact or contact, we wanna make the, the best uh, call on that. So that's something we're investigating. Last question on sports then is, we have big events, as always, coming up, and tourism is tied directly to that. NASCAR, a huge event in November, Fiesta Bowl, even looking ahead to 2021 with the golf tournament at a TPC. What is your feel about big sporting events? I saw the PSA earlier that seems to be optimistic about masking up at those events. Opening night is tonight. Fans want to know, when are they going to be back at these events, if these events will take place? And, and I, want to, I want to know as well. And as soon as we uh, have, have better information, we'll be able to give better guidance. I can tell you it, it's not today. It's not today. Um, when you talk about things like the Phoenix Open that happens at the last week of, of January, uh, th that's quite a, a ways off. NASCAR in, in November is still quite a, a ways off. Uh, today, baseball is going to participate without fans in the stands. There are discussions around uh, limiting capacity mm -hmm. in, inside some of these stadiums. Uh, it's something that I am open-minded to, but it's going to be guided by public health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate the time. I've got two questions here. I'll ask one and then a follow up. Uh, you announced when you announced Project Catapult, you said we would be uh, doing 35,000 tests a day by the end of this month. We have averaged somewhere around 12,000 tests. Um, so I guess the question of that is why are we not able to meet that 35,000 tests? And are we going to realistically be able to meet 65,000 in the next month? So Hank, uh, very uh, fair question. And Project Catapult uh, commits to 35,000 tests by the end of July and 60,000 tests by the end of August. I believe we will be able to hit that commitment. There has been a, a, a backlog. Uh, I find it unacceptable. We're having very candid discussions with our private labs on how to clear these backlogs and to make certain that people not only get a test uh, in a convenient way in, in places around the state, 375 different locations today, but that they get their results on a timely basis. So this is a, a very important. Now, something that I think people need to understand, and I know we've had our fair share of challenges with testing, and so have other states around this. That's not an excuse, it's a reality to just the crush around demand. We asked for specific help from the Centers for Disease Control and Health and Human Services. We had them here for 12 straight days in two separate locations with 5,000 tests available a day. Uh, we didn't hit capacity on one day. There simply wasn't the demand. And those tests were 12 minute wait times and a, a two day turnaround in terms of results. So we are gonna work with some uh, leaders in the community. We think uh, we have some ideas around uh, school districts 
universities, uh, corporations that want to begin to return uh, people to, to work in the safest possible environment where we'll be able to not only have capacity for tests, but be able to get people through those tests. And I think the other thing that we're hopeful for, and I've talked to Dr. Christ about this quite a bit, to date, you see that we're uh, at 11% in terms of positivity. Those are sick, symptomatic, and exposed people that are taking those tests and waiting in those lines. If we are able to open this up uh, to more of, of the curious or to the people that want to have more information mo before they make a decision around what their child or what uh, they'll, they'll do in terms of next steps in, uh, with, with their company, uh, we should be able to drive that number down dramatically. follow-up question. A month ago, you were imploring people to go out there, get tests, get tests, get tests. Uh, two weeks ago, you said you were surprised and overwhelmed by the response. The, uh, the demand was greater than the capacity. Now, it's taking two weeks for people to get their test results back, and they are not bothering to go get a test. How are you going to solve this, Governor? I mean, we, we need tests quickly available and with confidence that we will get results before people end up in the hospital or dead. We're working with our private sector providers uh, to fix this. It's, it's a priority. Like I've said, it's unacceptable. The one thing I want to say, Hank, that I don't believe is, is accurate, we've had 12 days of tests available, uh, convenient uh, turnaround time and short wait times. We've not hit capacity one day. Uh, you mentioned that backlog. I believe as of today it was still at around 29,000, which they cleared half of it in a week. So I guess um, you, you expressed your disappointment. I guess the question is, how does it get to a 60,000 backlog? How do they clear half of it in a week? And how confident are you going forward now that that surge is gone that we won't get another one? So, Matt, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Christ, and I also want to say this is a private sector provider, Sonora Quest. They need to step up their game. So there are several factors that played a role in, in getting to the backlog. So as with the swabs and the viral transport media, there is also national shortage of the reagents, so the, the test kits that you use to run those tests. Um, Sonora Quest, before the, um, the, the surge in testing demand, was getting surplus test kits that other laboratories were turning away. Um, recently, they stopped getting those because of the demand nationally. They had to go back to where they were initially ordered. So that was one issue. The reason that Sonora Quest has been able to, br to bring down that backlog so quickly over the last week is because of Project Catapult. So that is a platform that is coming from Europe. They brought it in. There are multiple lines that they have to install. So they've been bringing those lines up and validating those lines every couple of days. So hopefully by the end of today or tomorrow, they'll have the third line up that each one is about 6,000 tests that they can do. They'll continue to add those lines. Um, and so this, this specific platform is not dependent on those same reagents. There's no, um, there's no limit to the supply that they can get. So that issue should be cleared up. So I, I guess, uh, are, are these tests accurate or they even because they've been sitting there for so long? So these tests, yes. So they will be accurate. Um, it, it depends on how long you're storing it and where you're storing it. Sonora Quest has been storing them appropriately in um, a deep freeze at about negative 70, um, and they have enough freezer space. And, and then just a quick follow-up. I, I know we looked at the percent positives at around 11% now. That's the total. The rolling averages, though, are still around 20%. That's about one in five people who are getting tested. Uh, your thoughts on that? Because that number still seems way too high. The, the, the number over the last week is 11%. That's how we measure it. Now, we know that we've got, I think, 26,000 tests in, in the backlog today. The, the number's been coming down consistently over the last several weeks, and that's a good sign. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on Howie's question with people lose, going about to lose that $600 a week in federal unemployment insurance. 
um, it sounds like your plan is to wait and see what Congress I'm not do. that's not the plan that's what you said the, that the plan has been in cooperation and alignment with Congress a along the way yeah but what does Congress have to do with Arizona having the second lowest unemployment benefit in the country at two hundred and forty dollars a week you know people aren't going to be able to survive on that what options are you looking at right now since well, they're about we, to lose that money to get more money into the hands of these people who are suffering right now. We've worked very hard to make sure that Arizonans uh, have the resources that are necessary and that people are not losing uh, uh, the place where they live or uh, uh, th their home in this setting. We're going to, as we transition through this, it will require further cooperation with Congress. I don't have anything else to add right now. Well, I mean, we've done our job on this, Dennis. I need Congress to act. But the $240, I mean, they may not be evicted, but at some point at the end of this, if they're only getting. We're not at that point. <laughs> We're not at I, I want to follow up. Want to follow up We're on not one at other that thing. point, and I I'd said like I need to work with, with one Congress. more question. Um, I didn't hear in today's presentation that there was uh, the turnaround time. Last week it was 7.5 days uh, for people to get their results. Why wasn't that included today? Do we know what that number is today? And when is that number going to be included on the dashboard? I did ask you that last week, and it's still not on the dashboard. So the turnaround time, again, is dependent on labs. It's about eight and a half to nine days right now. So it's increased um, since last week. Because we are catching up with the backlog. So it will increase until they catch up to that, that two to three day turnaround. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this uh, federal legislation that's working its way through in Congress. Um, one of the provisions, I think at least in the Republican version, is uh, would add some new money and expand the Paycheck Protection Program, which has been an extremely vital lifeline to a lot of businesses here and all over the country. What would you like to see happen with, with uh, that proposal? What do you think of the amount of money that's going into it? Should there be more? Should this be made available to people who already got PPP money the first time around? So uh, it's, it's a good question. We wrote a very specific letter to, to our delegation, senators, and, and the Congress as a whole as to what we would like to see that would be in Arizonans' best interest. I think first and foremost, my concern is about our displaced workers in the state of Arizona, and uh, whether it's the, the supplemental check or it's some type of extension of unemployment insurance benefits uh, that can incent work, but also make sure that there's a social safety net that is stable for people that have been displaced because of the pandemic and because of the economic slowdown. And then our focus has always been around the PPE, uh, that it focus on small businesses than medium-sized businesses. It seems that the larger corporations always do fine through the, the downturn. Of course, the, the businesses that have been affected by uh, government decisions or mandates are also uh, businesses that I have a, a real concern for. I do want to say to date, uh, and I know that there is a, a, a timeline and a ticking clock right now. That's why I'm being so direct and emphatic on Congress acting with urgency. But to date, in such an economic crisis and downturn, we have been able to navigate the state through this. This has been more than just a lifeline for our people and our, our companies and our entrepreneurs. It's been more of a life raft. It may not uh, be the same amount that is necessary, but the same intentions of making certain that businesses that don't necessarily need to close and that need help to navigate through the current circumstances is, is something that both Treasury and Congress, along with the Fed, uh, has done a good job at. Should that be made available to people who have already gotten PPP money? I mean, especially with I think it depends on circumstances. Well, we I mean, some people have gotten PPP money. Right some people have gotten loans. Some people have gotten grants. Uh, it's it's across the board. I think we didn't know a lot of what was happening uh, in, in March. Today we know much more. We know some of these businesses are operating. Some businesses are are operating at a higher revenue than they would be if the coronavirus w were not here. I mean, those aren't the businesses I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the people that are hurting. It seems pretty obvious from 
One more about the legislation. It seems pretty obvious that they will extend some unemployment benefits, but uh, at least in the Republican plan in the Senate, it's not going to be the $600 I've been getting so far. It looks like I think $200 is the current proposal. Is that going to be enough for people? I mean, especially here in Arizona, as has been noted, has very low unemployment benefits at the state level. I, I'm hearing that they're looking for some type of, of baseline. Uh, they're, they're looking at this nationally. Of course, my concern is 100% focused on Arizona. They have their challenges in front of them. The, the supplemental part to Arizona is what's critical. And again, it's a, a way to provide a, a social safety net that's, that's strong and, and stable as people transition and navigate through this. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, so uh, the question isn't about, um, I guess it's not really even related to the pandemic, but it is about un unemployment. Um, is, you know, before the pandemic hit and after it's um, relieved, the, the state benefit's going to be $240. Is that enough? Should, um, you know, by definition to be on this program, you, you, you can't have been fired for cause. Um, you know, should that, should businesses be asked to contribute more to the trust fund so that uh, that uh, $240 can be higher. JJ, in, in many ways, it's a, it's a hypothetical question because unemployment wasn't really an issue before the pandemic. Uh, our unemployment rolls in uh, late February were 17,000 people with a few thousand people falling off every month and a few thousand people coming back on. Uh, last month, it was over one million people. That's why I've said now several times that we need Congress to act in this situation. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I guess the question is focused on that 17,000 people that, um, that, that, that were on it before the pandemic hit. Like, are you comfortable with those people trying to uh, make it work on $240. Again, JJ, those 17,000 people could all find a job at that point in time at any time. We had more jobs available than people to fill them. People have to use the social safety net for different reasons uh, along the way, but uh, in terms of employment being available, that was there in, in February and early March before this hit. Governor, I want to ask about uh, reopening bars, clubs, gyms, et cetera. Uh, do you have specific metrics? I know you said you talked to industry leaders yesterday about what that's going to look like. What are the numbers going to say to you when, when it's safe to open? Do you want to talk a little bit about public health and guidelines around bars and, and gyms? And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, our conversations with the stakeholder groups. Sure. So we're, we're looking for there to be decreased uh, community transmission. And what that's going to involve is it's going to involve case numbers. It's going to involve a reduction in the percent positivity because we know that these are higher risk activities. And so those are the things that there are groups that are involved. It's, it increases the transmissibility of the virus. So until we can be assured that the community spread has been minimized, um, we're going to continue to make recommendations that they remain closed. Is there like a specific number? Let me say, Zach, that, uh, and somebody else asked, can, can we be hopeful around uh, gyms and bars and, and nightclubs? And it really goes back to that idea of trying to disperse large adult gatherings where there can't be social distancing. And we had to work uh, not only through the Department of Liquor, but how licenses were, were granted if we're talking about the, the bars and the nightclubs. Today, we've got restaurants that are able to, to operate they're doing it at, at 50 percent or less capacity uh, it's basically a food service operation so we want to work with the stakeholders uh, when we do get it at the right place I mean we're headed in in the right direction and that's why these discussions are ramping up and I also want to say that there are gyms and there were some gyms 
that we're already operating in a very responsible way around this. The guidance will be much tighter uh, as we do go to move forward and uh, reopen so that we can, can just minimize the, the spread uh, around this. And uh, we're working with the stakeholders on this. We said that we would look at it in a two-week time frame going forward. Uh, that's coming up in this next week. So, of course, we're going to watch the hospitalization numbers, the, the cases, the positivity, all going in, in the right direction. Uh, if this is important to people, uh, they need to keep doing what they're doing and, and let us work with the leaders in, in the industry uh, in terms of what a safe reopening looks like. I want to ask you one more question because you mentioned football and I think a lot of people are, are thinking there may be mixed messages about trying to limit gatherings and then the fact that there's going to be practice and 50, 18 or, or 17 year olds working out in the same facility touching the same dumbbells. And there just sounds like it could be inevitable. One of those kids is asymptomatic, walks into the huddle or the gym and infects other kids or infects their teacher at school. So how are you thinking about this moving forward? I mean, we've seen it work in the NBA bubble. We saw what happened in the MLB. You know, how are you thinking about if one teacher gets infected at a school, is that whole school going to have to go to virtual learning again? Or what happens when one kid gets infected at a high school football game? This is a uh, part of what Dr. Christ is working so hard on with the uh, uh, Department of Ed Education is try to answer all these questions along the ways about what if. And the idea is we know the virus is, is widespread. Uh, we want to put kids in the safest possible position. Um, and so there's going to be more to follow on all of that. We're working with the AIA, uh, Public Health and Best Practices. Uh, I want to say, uh, where we are today in Arizona is dramatically different than where we were just a few short weeks ago. Again, I want to thank all of our citizens and all the people of Arizona for their participation and cooperation along the way. We have more to do. But if we keep doing the simple things that we've been doing, like limiting mobility, like when possible staying at home, wearing a mask, washing our hands, physically distancing, and when you're sick, staying home, you can see what a dramatic difference it's meant in our state and how it's protected lives and protected livelihoods. I want to ask you to stay the course, keep pressing, and uh, we'll keep communicating, and there will be more to follow uh, in the next uh, several weeks around school and sports uh, as the guidance and the metrics are determined. Thank you.